Hi there, welcome along to another video here with me, Jennifer Kirk. It's really good to see you back here. And today we've got a box opening and review. And this is something that I picked up uh, earlier this week. And it's a really great model. So without further ado, let's take a look at this uh, special locomotive from Hornby. <laughs> I've picked myself up one of these models and it has to be said that Hornby have really been coming through with some exceptionally good models uh, over the last few years and I'm finding myself buying more and more Hornby models to the detriment perhaps of some other manufacturers. This particular item passed my way and really it just tickled my fancy and uh, had to pick myself uh, one up. It's uh, got a catalogue number R3455 uh, and it's a Great Western Railway star class. Um, Knight of St. Patrick number 4013 and uh, I must admit I'm not really all that familiar with the star class. I tend to be uh, more au fait with the kings and the castles. But uh, really, this locomotive, it reminded me of uh, the castle class. In fact, at first glance, I thought it was a castle. And it's interesting, actually, these are kind of the genesis of that class. Some of them were ultimately rebuilt into castle classes. So it's probably understandable that uh, there's a family lineage there. It's one of the newer super detail models from Hornby and in some respects, for me at least, it's one that's been passing underneath the radar. So I'm going to quickly get this out of the now pretty familiar super detail Hornby box. It comes with a fairly typical uh, exploded diagram, gives you some information about where to oil it, some detail about the tender coupling that we've already talked about. But then also some detail about uh, DCC fitting the uh, model. And it's interesting to see there, uh, I'm just having a look. Um, it would appear on the face of it, there seems to be two different diagrams here, either with an 8-pin socket or it would seem that... Um, it's a 21-pin socket there. I'm not quite sure about that. When I've seen inside this, it does only have the 8-pin socket. So I'm not entirely sure whether what we're seeing here is that... Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, actually. That's a bit peculiar why it's showing both of these. So um, I'm sure in the comments somebody will, will tell me what's going on there. But what's interesting is that this comes pre-set up for... TTS sound fitting and the central weight here is removable and there is a perfect indentation underneath to take the TTS sound speaker and what I've decided with this and I'm going to show you a little bit about the TTS sound fitting later on is whilst there's not a specific chip to suit the star class I've gone with the castle class because of that uh, heritage of the locomotive and the fact that some of these were rebuilt into a castle class and my thinking is that that's probably going to be the perfect accompaniment to this locomotive but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. I checked this out in the shop and uh, uh, you know, with Hornby, and it's my big gripe with them, is it's quite often a little bit difficult to tell the difference between older tooling that really should belong in the railroad range and newer high definition models. Uh, there's no real clues in the catalogue numbers or anything like that, but I was really pleased when I got this out to see that this is actually a really finely detailed model. And we can see it's a pretty hefty uh, model and it comes 
semi-permanently attached with the tender and actually I'm going to start on that first because it's another area that's been a big gripe for me with models that we've been getting from uh, both Hornby but to a larger extent from Backman and that's the the way that the tender attaches to the locomotive when you've also got these wires um, coming across from the DCC socket and I'm pleased to say that Hornby have taken on board um, these problems which would otherwise put a lot of strain potentially on these wires and can cause an awful lot of problems down the line and it's permanently attached it's actually screwed at both ends so unlike the uh, Backman models where it's very easy for them to come undone and then effectively be pulling the train by just the wire alone uh, we've got a much more substantial drawbar there and it's got a, an interesting sort of figure of eight style hole there so it is possible to undo this screw and closer couple the tender to the locomotive if you've either got really really gentle curves on your model railway or if you're going to be putting this into a display cabinet. The motion and wheels on here are particularly fine and it's got this sort of crosshead detail which is for me it looks pretty much like the castle class and I suppose because this uh, locomotive shares uh, heritage with the castle class that's probably quite understandable it's a very distinctive style of sort of flares out there and uh, some of you might remember this from the old Hornby double O models from back in the day it's certainly where I'm familiar with uh, that particular look we've also got um well, an awful lot of very fine rivet detail. My eye is really caught by this tender here and the rivet detail on these tender sides, Hornby and Backman too, it has to be said, are really capturing that uh, very, very well. It doesn't look over large um, and it's it's still I'm running my thumb over there. You can feel the raised detail and they're very sharp and well defined. The livery that this model is coming in, we've got the G the crest and the W and I was kind of hoping that this might be a pre-1923 livery. I'm not entirely sure on that. It's one of the areas that's really difficult to uh, kind of get your head around with the Great Western Railway and I've talked a little bit about this before as to uh, where the pre and post 1923 liveries lie. I also should perhaps have pointed out that on the back of the box, Hornby has quite helpfully given us some information about the class. And uh, we've also got some works drawings here that were drawn up by Hornby. And it's got the date on here of 2011. So this really is a pretty up-to-date model. The actual groundwork for it has been done um, seven maybe eight years ago. But it's an interesting class, it has to be said. It was very inspired by French compound locomotives that Churchwood uh, had uh, persuaded the GWR board to uh, buy. Uh, they got three examples for comparative trials. And these trials showed that whilst the Saints were as efficient as the French engines, uh, the four-cylinder design resulted in a much smoother ride at high speed. Uh, the original prototype locomotive that the GWR built was built as a 442 wheel arrangement. And you might think that that would be radically different from this, but actually the locomotive was built with an eye to being able to easily convert it to a 460 wheel arrangement. And I believe that that was eventually done. And the 460 wheel arrangement was really about getting a better tractive effort and better grip. Uh, to the rail head. Looking back to the model we've got um, pretty nicely applied uh, lining here and uh, this was something when I was in the shop I had a choice between this and a 28XX280 uh, freight locomotive and this tipped the balance for me because it just looked more eye-catching with the, um, the level of detail. The 28XX just seemed too plain in my mind but of course that's probably to be expected given that that was a, a freight locomotive and this was an express locomotive. It has the typical Great Western Railway embellishment in terms of the brass safety dome, very typical, very uh, distinctive Great Western Railway feature. And then we've got the copper chimney cap. And these are nicely done and they're actually in separate colours. 
So the copper of the chimney cap looks like copper, whereas the brass of the safety valve dome is a, is a brass colour. And that's a nice touch. It could have been so easy for them to just use the same colour paint. Now, they don't have that metallic finish that more recent Hornby offerings have had, such as the H-Class, the Wainwright H-Class, and the fully lined Southeastern and Chatham Railway livery. But I don't think that detracts. Um, you know, I quite like this. It looks a little bit more subdued, and in all honesty, probably a little bit more realistic as well, uh, because they would have quickly developed a uh, kind of sheen to the surface that wouldn't have been quite as bright as freshly polished metal when running in service. We've got what appear to be, um, and I could be wrong, but they do look as good as an etched brass nameplate. And even if that is just uh, plastic uh, as part of the splasher moulding, it is really good. I can't really see a need to actually add uh, etched brass nameplates to this if that is just the plastic moulding because they are really well done. We've also got the typical Great Western cast number on the side of the cab there, 4013. But it is um, it is smooth, and uh, that is an area where I could see that this locomotive might be improved for having etched brass numbers, because the real uh, GWR numbers were a solid brass casting, so would have been raised up off the locomotive sides. Another area which I can see here, which I think is particularly pleasing and well done, is we can see down inside the red finished uh, motion and valve gear. It doesn't go round when the locomotive runs, but in double O gauge, you wouldn't really expect that. But it's nice to see it actually there. And it's something that more recent models from all the manufacturers have taken a greater eye to detail over and getting a representation of what's actually in between the frames on the real locomotives and it looks so much better than just having an empty void or a, a plain finished weight that kind of once you see it you can't unsee it. In terms of other detail on this you know it's it's a fairly simple but effective locomotive and the super detailed nature of this model is particularly well done by Hornby. We've got a front bogey which is it feels like a pretty heavy metal casting and it's sprung loaded so it's going to follow the track particularly well and indeed when I've done a quick test run of this locomotive it has run pretty well. We've also got a fairly springy I think that they they appear to be metal wire uh, sandpipes ready fitted. One area here that I've noticed is missing from my model, and this is probably because I bought this second hand, is the uh, brake rigging from underneath is missing. It doesn't appear to have been factory applied and uh, nowhere is it in the box. But that doesn't detract from Hornby. Clearly it would have had that. And as we've seen in other models, it's probably a fairly easy fitment to add yourself but the fact that it's missing isn't really a massive problem because when this locomotive is running on the track you're not really going to see any of that in terms of pickups, uh, we've got phosphor bronze wipers on all six of the driven uh, main wheels. And we also, by the looks of things, have uh, some quite well hidden wipers on the backs of the wheels on the tender. So electrical pickup from this locomotive is particularly good. And that really comes into its own when DCC fitting this model, because the last thing you want is for it to stutter and struggle in getting a constant uh, pickup from the track. Underneath, before I turn it back over, you can also see a representation here of the water scoop that would have been used to replenish the tender's water supply from water troughs whilst the train remained in motion. In terms of couplings, we've also got slimline tension lock couplings in a NEM pocket on the rear there. And even though I'm missing the parts to fit it in, on the second hand example, I can just show you there on the front of the bogey, we've also got another pocket there to be able to mount a front uh, coupling. So 
it's there if you want it in the box if you buy one of these brand new but if you don't want to fit it because they can be quite an ugly thing uh, and generally speaking these express locomotives would have always been turned um, at the end of the line to always head smoke box first in whichever direction that they were traveling it's no great um, problem that it doesn't have a coupling on the front we've also got a it appears factory fitted vacuum pipes and uh, we've got fully sprung buffers and these are very pleasing very fine turned metal examples the front face of the locomotive is particularly well captured and uh, you've got the very typical great western joggling of the frame here uh, it's probably got a proper term uh, but th that's the word that's come to mind and um, it's a very distinctive look on great western locomotives and Hornby have managed to capture it pretty perfectly in my mind. If we look down upon this we can see that there doesn't really appear to be any parting line to the top of the boiler but what I can see is there appears to be a very very faint line just down there and again on the other side and I'm not entirely sure it is very very faint whether that is to do with the tooling or it may be that that is prototypically correct for the way that the uh, cladding on the real locomotives would have been put on but I, I stand to be um, educated in that if anybody can leave a comment uh, below if they know the origin of these lines here. We've got some very very fine handrails, uh, they're metal wire, factory applied all the way around and then we've also got separately applied pipe work down the side of the boiler and it really does look nice. In days of old we would have seen all this hard moulded as part of the model and it looked really clunky and horrible and it is really good to see that manufacturers have got far far away from that. Just pulling the tender to one side and we can see there in the cab, this really is where the detail gets going and really revs up. You can see all of the copper pipe work separately picked out and uh, it's hard to tell. I think some of those fittings are separately applied but some of them are moulded on. But really it's difficult to tell and that really is the standard that we've come to expect and enjoy from the manufacturers. You can see the regulator there picked out in gunmetal actually does appear to be a separate metal fitting and we've also got their separate plastic fitting for the uh, mechanism that would on the full-sized locomotive operate the firebox doors uh, we've got the reverse screw linkage there again picked out in a gunmetal color it really is nice in there there is a full plate which I'm not sure, it doesn't feel like it's poseable between the tender and the locomotive. And if there is a detraction, potentially, it is that they don't really quite line up and mesh properly. They look a bit out of place, but it's not desperately bad. Turning to the tender, again, we've got a representation of a coal load and uh, Hornby have really done this well. We've got this sort of three humps here and it does look like a locomotive that has been coaled from a coaling plant rather than just having some generic representation of coal. And I can feel a slight movement in this so it is possible to remove it and inside there will be a representation of the empty tender if you want to um, customise your locomotive to look like one which is coming to the end of its run. In terms of other detail we've got these particularly fine flanges on the tops of the tender and they are pretty thin and really nicely done. On the back of the model just very very quickly we can see we've got separately applied lamp brackets and uh, these little footholds as well look like they are separately applied and you can actually looking down you can see daylight through them. Overall, I'll give this model a pretty good 9.5 out of 10 on my completely arbitrary and made up on the spur of the moment scale. But that just goes to show how much I like this. I'm really quite taken with the Great Western Railway locomotives. The prototypes were particularly beautiful and elegant locomotives. And in model form, Hornby has captured this particular prototype exceptionally well. There's a couple of small niggly flaws which I've pointed out, but they don't really go uh, any great way to put me off this locomotive and they are certainly minor flaws that can easily be lived with. When it comes to DCC fitting this model this is really where it, it comes into its own and I've not 
actually had a uh, TTS capable model that's been this easy to fit. I have not had to modify anything to get the TTS Castle chip into this model, which is pretty pleasing because up until now I've been thwarted a lot of the time by models where you have to do a bit of cutting, a bit of filing and uh, trying to stick things in with tape just to get everything square. With this, none of that whatsoever. Removing the top of the tender is easy. There's two screws on the underside. Undo these, unplug the little wires for the handrails at the front, and the tender top just lifts cleanly off. Inside you can immediately see the 8-pin socket at the back and uh, this metal weight, this metal weight is important, don't remove it, but the TTS chip, the speaker, fits into a recess underneath. There's just two screws to undo, the weight lifts off and that speaker can just be positioned within the circular raised area face down. Once that's in, it's a pretty easy task to run the wires underneath where the weight's going to go. Screw that weight back back in and then make sure that your chip is away from where the coal chute in the tender is going to fit back on and uh, just you know tuck it to the back tuck some of the wires underneath there's actually a space under the back of the weight where the wires can be run and it just helps to keep them in place and stops them from getting trapped when you now come to put the tender top back on just make sure that those wires don't get trapped to either side you can tease them back in with a small jeweler's screwdriver and then it's top back on, screw it down and onto the test track which is uh, very easy to set up by default. All these chips come as uh, our loco ID number 3 so we can set it up on that. And then what I do is I just change the ID number to, in this case, the same number as what's on the locomotive and then it's pretty easy to find it again. The sound files for this are pretty good to my ears. As I've said before, the TTS chips offer really good value for money and the actual steam and the chuffing noises and some of the others too, like shoveling of coal, are fairly generic to my ears across the range, but it does have the appropriate whistle and for the cost of, well, about a third of the more expensive chips, I think it's actually a really good compromise and fitting of it in this locomotive was an absolute doddle. Well, I hope you found that interesting and uh, I hope that the TTS sound fitting guide was useful too. It's been really good to have you watching this. Thanks for watching. And until next time, don't forget to check out my books. Also, if you really want to support the channel, you can also check us out on Patreon details at the end of the video. But uh, don't forget to tickle that like button and uh, share it too. And also subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. And ring that bell and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. But until next time, thanks again for watching. This is me, Jennifer Kirk, saying you take really good care of yourself. And I'll see you back here again. Bye for now. Today's video has been brought to you in part thanks to the generous donation of my fans on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson. Mark Anthony, Michael Churchwood, Mark McShane, Bob Threeton, Alec Ralph, Anthony Hunt, and William Wade. If you'd like to help support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash Jennifer Kirk. Thank you. Today's video has been brought to you by my books, Bringing Home the Stars, Twinkle Little Star, and also you can get the complete comic collections of All Over the House, Books 1, Books 2, and also the wacky zany Life of Nobty Mouse. Thanks and catch you later.